From Microbe TV, this is Tweevo. This Week in Evolution, episode number 50, recorded on December 23rd, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels Eldy. Greetings from LD Lab Studios. Good to be back. Number 50. Good number, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, pretty exciting. Good round number there. Um, in, we're well into our fifth season of Twivo and um, last one of the year, 2019. It's been a fun one. It has. Yeah, we... Uh, did a lot of cool stuff. Had you had a couple of guests, I think, this year. Had a few good guests. We even got in some international drama by going over to that meeting in Germany. The last couple episodes, um, giant virus symposium in the Ringberg. Mm. So it's fun. We should go back to that in a couple of years. Yeah, count me in for sure. <laughs> <laughs> if Matthias will have us back. And this is the twenty third of December, and Nels and I are. Just cranking out a podcast for everybody. Going for it. Yeah, kind of quiet over here at LD Lab Studios today. The hallways are kind of cleared out, all the holiday travel yeah. underway. But it's actually, I love this kind of quiet time of the year to, well, I guess in this case, podcast, but also to just kind of catch up and clear the head a little bit when not so many people are around. And if you're traveling, you know, you could pop on the earbuds and listen to Tuivo. That's right. We'll bring in some uh, holiday cheer with some evolutionary science. <laughs> <laughs> If you like what we do here on Tuivo and all the other Microbe TV podcasts, consider supporting us. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. I have a few ways you can do that. We'll tell you more about it later. Yeah, that would be a great holiday gesture to support the work across Microbe TV. Yeah, it doesn't cost much, so <clears throat> stay tuned. Exactly. So, 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 Nels, we're visiting a theme today that we've touched on this year, right? Yeah. So we've, you know, we've spent a lot of time, uh, Vincent, in the last couple months thinking about viruses and some big genomes for viruses, but still pretty small genomes. And so now we're returning to chromosomal evolution, in, in particular, sex chromosome evolution. Um, I think the la our last foray into this topic was with uh, strawberry plant sex chromosomes, um, the notion that you have both female and male plants. Turns out to be pretty different than our own um, sex chromosomes. So we're, th we're thinking about vertebrates today and the X and the Y chromosome, and in particular, the evolution of vertebrate Y chromosomes. So you must say why. <laughs> <laughs> Y chromosome? Why? 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So um, we'll get we'll get to the why, the what, the where, the all the W's, including the Y, in a few minutes. But maybe just to set up the paper. So there, um, in fact, there is a W chromosome, right? There is, yeah, exactly. So uh, <laughs> birds, I think, have that different, yeah. Uh, yeah, different systems. All kinds of diversity. These are rapidly evolving, really interesting systems. Um, a lot of chaotic evolution, and so um, just as genomic technology is starting to catch up with some of the um, really fascinating questions that have, um, you know, been on the minds of evolutionary biologists for generations, we're actually getting to a point where we're getting some real resolution on, on and just starting to peek at some of these concepts that are emerging from how how um, species adapt and evolve through the basis of having separate sexes. You know, you say chaotic evolution. You know mm. what Sidney Brenner said about evolution, right? Um, help remind me. Anything made by evolution is bound to be a bit of a mess. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that, and I think that applies to today's <laughs> paper. So, and I have a confession. So, I actually, to you know, we kind of pick our papers in many. Or that our topics and papers in many different ways. Sometimes, and we really appreciate when people send in ideas um, or requests of papers. Uh, word of mouth also um, is sort of a great way to do it. For this one, I actually just went to the bioarchive, clicked on evolutionary biology, hmm. <laughs> and this one was at the top of the list. Hmm. Um, but I think it's actually a really good choice because we're returning to sort of uh, Sidney Brenner's messy evolution in the context of sex chromosome evolution. Um, we'll kind of hit on some of those connections you already mentioned. Um, and this is also from a lab, one of my favorite groups out there. So Katie Peichel, um, who's a stickleback behavioral evolutionary geneticist 
um, has been running this um, study related to some of our other work. I'll touch on that in a little bit as well. But they just dropped on the bioarchive um, maybe a, a week or two ago this paper t- entitled Assembly of a Young Vertebrate Y Chromosome Reveals Convergent Signatures of Sex Chromosome Evolution. And so um, my overlap with Katie goes back to my days when I was a postdoc at the Fred Hutch. Mm-hmm. Uh, Katie Peichel had her lab there. And then more recently moved to the University of Bern in uh, Switzerland, not too far from where we were um, in Bavaria at the giant virus meeting. Um, but there for several years now, maybe four or five years, she's been running the Division of Evolutionary Ecology. Um, and the paper is sort of, I think, a crossover between some of the work that was started at the Fred Hutch. And so some kind of familiar names from my time there, some colleagues, Sean McCann, Joe Ross, uh, Jen Check. A few others, and then this is a collaboration um, with some sort of with a well-known stickleback crew, so David Kingsley's lab out of Stanford, and we'll talk a little bit more about how sticklebacks have been sort of a workhorse of uh, Evo Devo evolution and development or uh, developmental biology, developmental biology, and then some kind of heavyweights in um, genome science. So Richard Myers, who was at Stanford and runs a research institute, I think in Alabama, if I'm remembering correctly. The, um, and then uh, Michael White, who recently opened his lab at the University of Georgia and has been involved in this work for a while and does a lot with sort of high quality, um, high uh, sort of difficulty genome assembly and uh, stickleback fish in this court case counts in, in that category. Is that what you do, difficult genome assembly, Nels? Uh, no, I do low. <laughs> <laughs> I do low complexity. So, I do sort of genomics for shy, modest uh, <laughs> Swedish people. So we do one of the fun, you know, reasons we picked viruses, but you know, relatively big virus, but the vaccinia virus or pox viruses, is that you know, two hundred KB is pretty different than half a gigabase, yeah. for example. And so you can really, we're still using some of these techniques, the long read sequencing and some um, some of the newer pipelines, and collaborating with genome scientists, but. We have a relatively easy genome relative to certainly to any vertebrate genomes out there. But you you enjoy hearing about complex genome assembling, right? Yeah, no, I, so I'm yeah, I'm pretty fascinated by kind of, and we talked about this a lot on Twivo, the confluence of the genetic or the genomic technology with the um, biological or evolutionary questions, mm-hmm. how it's kind of coming together and sort of revealing. I and mean, that was one of our, I think, motivating factors for starting Twivo was having this sort of, you know, living into this era where we can actually understand the genome sort of at really fine detail, but also at sort of the 30,000 foot view sure. as a way of really advancing things. Yeah. So you so, me- you mentioned sticklebacks as a model organism. That's something we've talked about a lot recently, right? Model organisms. What yeah. is it about these fish that make them models? Yeah, great question. So, um, the three binds, three bind, three spined stickleback fish in particular, as I mentioned, sort of this workhorse of Evo Devo. So we hinted at this back on Twivo Seven. This is a um, we had a, the get, a in-house guest, one of my local colleagues here, Mike Shapiro. Um, and he emerged from David Kingsley's lab. That was his postdoc at Stanford before he came and opened his lab at Utah. And actually, most of that episode we talk about mm. um, pigeons, which Mike kind of shifted his entire research program. Um, but Mike. From the Kingsley Lab, uh, Katie who came out of the Kingsley Lab. There's also Dolph Schluter, who's up at um, Vancouver. A bunch of other labs. I'm thinking Dan Bolnick out on the East Coast now. I think he's in Connecticut. Have really um, championed this uh, organism, the stickleback fish, um, in, in several different ways. So first of all, um, to get a sense of uh, how developmental biology works in vertebrate systems. So these sticklebacks are really um, live in these cool sort of almost um, dual citizenship between freshwater and saltwater. They move um, from fresh to, to oceans. Um, some populations do this uh, in separately. So that as the populations spread apart, um, some become ocean goers while others hang out in lakes. Um, a lot of the glaciation events that happened um, over geological time have isolated these populations in small alpine lakes kind of all around the world. And so it's sort of a fascinating natural experiment in how uh, an entire species, um, or in, in beyond that, even in the genus, has sort of under, undergone all these massive morpho- morphological changes. So a lot of the ocean goers have these like crazy armor plates to protect them against predators, whereas the some of the ones in isolated lakes are much more 
kind of wimpy and have evolved in other directions. And so um, the efforts have kind of grown that system into a, the, the genetic tools to be able to ask, what is the genetic basis of some of these morphological changes? And so that's where Mike and um, others have found sort of the genetic basis of how you might make a modified fin that becomes a way of a spike or a spine that protects you from predators um, or how, um, you know, even hind limbs from um, fish become fins and, and questions like that. And so it's really been a great system. The thing that I think it adds in particular, and this is just uh, continuing to grow, uh, become more powerful is the ecological sort of ideas that I hinted at with all of this distribution around the world, highly related populations that might get isolated in sort of recent evolutionary time to kind of, kind of get a snapshot of what can happen really quickly um, over evolution in terms of diversification um, in populations. How, about how big are these sticklebacks? Yeah, so they're relatively small, which also makes them a good, hmm. um, you know, lab critter to bring in. So I think they range from maybe three inches to um, <clears throat> five inches, something like that. So, Some of them are smaller. So bigger than zebrafish, right? Bigger than zebrafish. And I would say what kind of distinguishes them from zebrafish in some ways is that worldwide distribution again. So hmm. Zebrafish are now found around the world mostly because they're in, um, you know, research institutes around with <laughs> developmental biologists um, taking care of them. But also, of course, in the aquarium industry as well, um, they've turned out to be a really um, sort of resilient and interesting, given those zebra stripes, um, you know, workhorse of the aquarium industry. Mm. Uh, difference here, though, is so I think you can trace all of zebrafish to um, a pretty small geographical location near the Ganges River, in the Ganges River. Some of the tributaries are smaller um, arteries leading into it um, in India. Whereas the sticklebacks you can find basically mm -hmm. all over the world. Yeah. Yep. So has anyone described a virus of stickleback fish? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> since, I think the yeah, that's right. <laughs> since Nels has this, his lab has described a picornavirus of zebrafish. Yeah, we had this fun preprint that um, is out there. Now we're working on getting that published in, mm -hmm. uh, a little more, trying to get it across the finish line. But yeah, um, I don't remember offhand if there's um, described viruses of sticklebacks, but you might be careful. You, you might, uh, you know, get me to. Yeah, here we go. An iridovirus from three spine oh. stickleback from 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a ways back. Yeah. Iridovirus could... is uh, they're pretty big. Yeah, they are. So large double-strand DNA viruses. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what I'm kind of on the lookout for zebrafish would be a large DNA virus. No no offense intended to the picornaviruses there, Vincent. But, no problem. But you, you, according to your preprint, you seem to have a picornavirus. Yeah, and it's pretty cool. And so we're trying to launch it now. You want to do that on TWIV when it's accepted? I'd love to. Yeah, I'll keep you posted. Yeah, you come on, do that. That would be fun. That would be fun. We're heading back out to review now, so a little... Okay little blip on the radar, but I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted. All right. So one of the really cool things about sticklebacks, in addition to sort of some of that ecology is so in Katie Peichel's lab in particular, um, has picked the system up to try to study behavioral evolution, um, and the, the genetic basis of, uh, complex behaviors. And this is really ambitious. So, you know, we're talking about, um, Trying to understand this is you know something that is a, a completely fascinating topic when we think about how much of our own behavior, for example, is sort of dictated or encoded somehow in our genetics. Um, but then you know moving to sort of more simple systems, um, and then with genetic tools to ask if you can actually start to get at sort of the basis of this. And so for the sticklebacks and in Katie's lab, they had some really cool projects. I'm not sure if they're, how active they are still, but on um, fish schooling behavior. So you know how fish, when they get into big, some fish, not others, but when they get into big um, collections, especially small fish that are preyed on by um, larger predators, for protection, they'll school together. And so I can remember um, visiting the fish tanks in Katie's lab at the Fred Hutch, and they had these little faked, fake um, fish schools that were on like a um, bicycle wheel, and you would hand crank it to cause the fake fish to swim in one direction, <laughs> and, then, and then the real fish would join it cool. <laughs> in a school if they were, you know, from some strains of sticklebacks would do that. And then other sticklebacks, you could throw them in with the fake schooling set of fish, and they didn't care at all. And so you had these two really different behaviors, sort of this innate um, sort of impulse or whatever it is to school, and then ones that are closely related but that don't 
sort of get with the program at all and are just sort of <laughs> more mm. individuals or something. So the idea was was to take these really divergent behaviors, mate those fish together, get F1s, F2s, and then map that trait. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out to be easy, easy to say, harder to do. And so you end up falling into these like kind of complex genetic scenarios where there's probably many loci in the genome that are um, involved in this. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a really hard ongoing question. I think the closest we've seen this, um, some success in this area in behavioral evolutionary genetics is um, – from Hopi Hoaxter's group. Um, and we, we had her as a guest on Twivo number 15. And it, it, for part of that, she was telling us some about the burrowing behavior of mice and some of the other projects where they're also starting to attack um, some of behavioral traits and try to get a um, genetic understanding, and evolutionary understanding about how these things can come up. So anyway, lots of um, cool work here and ways that you can imagine, I think, in the future, um, how... Y- these systems might be applied to really unravel the genetic basis of some, some really cool biology here, but to kind of maybe step back. So one uh, question, this is the topic of the paper to kind of get back on track here is now using this genetic system, which has, you know, um, pretty good, uh, genomes of sticklebacks. Um, but what is sort of lacking currently, and this is, um, where the work picks up is to use the system to examine the evolution of the male Y chromosome, um, which is a uh, turns out to be an interesting example of the emergence of the Y chromosome in vertebrate evolution. Um, and in fact, even though there's a good reference genome sequence from sticklebacks, it's from a female, not a male. And so the Y chromosome, the male specific mm. chromosome, is sort of neglected up to this point. A little bit of work from Katie's um, lab over the last several years, but here they really kind of crush it with a with a big genomic uh, genome science sort of tools that, um, that we'll talk about. And so, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, uh, sex chromosome evolution on Twivo, but we've mostly been talking about homomorphic sex chromosomes, and these you find in plants. So I'm doing my callback to our earlier t- sort of year in review of Twivo, or years in review of Twivo, <laughs> <laughs> episode 35, Strawberry Sex Chromosomes Forever. Remember mm-hmm. when we talked about these, these guys? Tell us what again what homomorphic is. Yeah, so basically, um, the sex chromosome, so between males and females, the um, is you know from a karyotype standpoint or looking under a microscope, that chromosome looks the same between males and females. Um, you can't tell the difference under a microscope or using sort of um, yeah you know sort of, uh, histology or cytogenetics you can't tell the difference between these okay so we don't call them XY because they're not morphologically different right yeah that's right and so XY which are heteromorphic so you can um, you know if you squish out the chromosomes and do a karyotype if you're a male you can find that sort of the, the in a human male in the 23rd set it's not a matching set so you can find mm. one X but then the Y looks nothing like it Um and that's an, uh, an ex- and that holds basically um, for I think most, if not all, vertebrates, and also some invertebrates as well. So things like fruit flies, Drosophila, also have heteromorphic sex chromosomes as well. But these homomorphic ones are different, right? At the yeah, sequ- that's at the right. sequence level, right? Yep, that's right. And so when we were talking about strawberries, I mean, this is another complicated system. So they're first of all they're octoploid, so they have eight copies mm-hmm. of the chromosomes, <laughs> and um, it's another sort of example of messy or chaotic evolution where the sex determining genes are encoded in a cassette that can actually translocate to different locations right. in the genome, right? right? right. Yeah, and that was, that was really an interesting. How, so they're, they're kind of getting at the mechanism and sort of how that system works in that paper that we considered on episode 35. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't really need to have it in one chromosome, right? Yeah. No, there's all kinds. So nature has figured out all kinds of ways. Mm to sort of come up with solutions for having two sexes. And of course, you know, which kind of raises the question, why would you have two sexes in, in the first place? Um, and so all of these kind of messy chaotic systems, what they have in common is they help to facilitate genetic recombination. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you recombine um, sort of diverged uh, chromosomes, you increase the chances of sort of coming up with new combinations of alleles or mutations or things like that, that, Um, look like that helps to um, keep a population going both against sort of um, outward sources so predators and parasites for example but also 
recombination also brings in the sort of possibility of renewing um, your genetic material or keeping it or keeping some fidelity. So if you have two copies of something and you screw up one, you can always you can go back or sort of rest on the second copy, the redundant copy, to then actually bring that back in a in a um, actual working form. And so, sort of major contributions of recombination or being able to um, to have sex to both diversify but also sustain um, populations through um, sort of sustainable genetics, if you will. When when roughly in evolution did did sexes arise? Yeah, great question. So I think for the um, you know w- leading to our own lineage, the humans, I think the estimates are like three hundred million years or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so um, you know this puts us back for um, it's kind of mammalian chromosomes to not quite to the fish, but pretty close in terms of the last common ancestor. Um, and they're probably single cells, right? Well, so not at 300 million years. So we're still animals by then. So the divergence with fish is estimated to be about half a billion years ago. Yeah. Um, the origins of sex itself goes back really far. Um, yeah. So into the billions of years. Mm. And so that the idea of sex as an innovation is really ancient. Yeah. But then what the, um, idea of the X and the Y that actually comes up later and then it's also comes up sort of repeatedly. So there's this turnover of X chromosomes or sorry, of Y chromosomes or sex male sex chromosomes. And then you sort of start with a new system at different times. And in fact, that's what turns out to make the sticklebacks for this paper, sort of a really attractive target to go after is that it's considered a relatively young Y chromosome. Mm -hmm. So, and the, um, that, that probably arose based on Comparisons to other species of sticklebacks, the nine spine stickleback, this is the three spine that um, they're focusing on for this work. Um, those diverged about, uh, I think, 26 million years ago. And that Y chromosome that's encoded, carried forward by the three spine stickleback, actually is unique to that lineage. And so it's, they estimated, I think, at the end to be something like 21 or 22 million years old, actually. So mm. uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, that's really recent. And in fact, much more recent. Than our own, uh, our our Y chromosome, which I think is estimated to date back to 300 million years, and so um, I actually have a link here um, that I put on that I was just kind of refreshing my memory for the um, podcast. And there's a really nice story from Joe Pelka from NPR. This is from more than 10 years ago now, um, but he uh, sort of describes this. He's talking to David Page, who's done a lot of Y chromosome evolutionary work uh, from the human chromosome. And, and so we'll, I'll include that link. Um, those guys probably explain it a little better <laughs> than I do. But um, basically the idea is that if we try to trace back to the origins of our own Y chromosome, which started out as the X and then t- diverged from it, and we'll talk about how that worked, um, how that happened, you know, or how that's kind of unfolded in, in sticklebacks more recently, we, the estimate is that given the current roughly 1,000 genes on the X chromosome, on the human Y, there's now probably only about 80 genes left. And so it's this notion of degradation that the, that the chromosome is actually sort of slipping away <laughs> genetically. You, you lose genes, you do these major deletion events, it's, it's pretty repetitive, it's kind of a genetic desert in a way. Um, but then the news isn't all bad for males, so you, um, there's reasons why the Y chromosome will probably stick around. Um, and and even, you know, it's taken 300 million years to get to this sort of level of disrepair. So we don't have to sort of, you know, as um, males of the species, I don't think we have to, like, you know, worry too much about males being wiped off the face of the earth or something like that. Well, if it works without them, what's the difference, right? Well, yeah, you've, so that's right. So then you've, there's usually what happens is these things arise uh, de novo in some new way. Yeah. And that's in the relatively recent past for stickleback fish, three by Spine stickleback. So if you go yeah. if you go past the twenty six million years where the Y or emerged in this stickleback, before that were there were two X's or no. So I think there were still so definitely um there's still two sexes. It was just the um the basis, the sort of it was more homomorphic chromosomal right? basis was different. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. So then it's, that that begs the question of what is the driver of having a separate Y, right? Yeah. And so I think so that um that's a it's a really interesting question, and this idea that you can um, replace sex chromosomes or that they're turned over by 
um, translocation or um, replacement of the sex determining gene. So that's ultimately what this boils down to, right? Is having some way of encoding the genes that will determine whether you're a male or a female um, or of a different sex, depending on the system, mm -hmm. uh, separated out into that one, um, you know, sex, the male um, compared to the female. And so one place where you, so 26 million years is relatively young, the sticklebacks are considered a, a young, quote unquote, young Y chromosome. However, um, if you really want to see kind of the blink of the eye, there's this really cool work um, that's been emerging from Doris Backtrog's lab at Berkeley over the last um, decade or so using Drosophila uh, Miranda. Um, and here you get these so-called Neo Y chromosomes that kind of, from an evolutionary standpoint, just emerged yesterday. And so mm -hmm. that gets you closer to that sort of separation event where something happens, it's pretty pivotal in sort of the birth of mm -hmm. a sex mm -hmm. chromosome. But remember, there's so much flexibility here. So like the homomorphic um, ones that you find in plants, um, in those octoploid genomes, there you can just take this cassette of genes, sex-determining genes, and sort of move them from chromosome to chromosome. And then that can sort of, in different ways, dictate the basis of what it means to be a, a male or a female um, strawberry plant. So Right. Now, yeah. so the Y in animals that have XY, the Y chromosome determ determines maleness. Mm -hmm. And How many genes are needed for that, do we know? Yeah, so I think, again, it's going to depend on um, the system. And that's one of the fun things about this paper is that they actually get to a candidate based. So they take a candidate approach. It's known in other vertebrates what some of these genes are um, involved in the development of um, sort of the male reproductive tract or the female reproductive tract. And then if you express them differently, um, given that you have sort of a unique combination or, or you know, um, or lack them on one chromosome versus another, that can then be the basis of sex determination. Mm -hmm. It can get pretty wild. So we, you know, in systems like yeast, um, there are all, there are this um, specific endonucleases that come and can switch a mating type, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. A to alpha. Right. Um, in ciliates, these single cell protozoans, uh, the one that I'm sort of most familiar with, tetramino, which I studied as a graduate student for different reasons, um, it actually has seven mating types. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> the basis of that was discovered um, from Ed Orius's lab in Santa Barbara maybe 10 years ago now, maybe a little bit longer ago. And so there's all kinds of different ways um, to be male or female, or if you're a tetrahymena, to be one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. So, you know, imagine like a protozoan dating website where you have mm. to <laughs> identify in seven different categories. And then, and then you can also put things like temperature regulation on top of that. So, in a lot of reptiles, um, you know, it depends on as your so the um, sex chromosomes might be the same, but then depending on the temperature that the egg is incubated at, can lead to a developmental switch between mm. being a male or a female. Mm. And so, yeah, so evolution has come up with all kinds of different sort of messy solutions to this exact sort of outcome, which is to have two sexes. I think what's in common though is the sort of from a long view the benefit of having these systems of recombination, um, however they are encoded. Mm. Yeah. So returning to the Y chromosomes, they're marked by rapid evolution, repetitive sequences, and um, massive inversion, structural stuff. They can be these r long runs of palindromes that go into the sort of hundreds of thousands of bases, um, DNA bases. And so they've been really hard to study um, and hard to sequence. So if you use kind of the... So last gen sequencing technology, so Sanger or mm -hmm. those kind of things, um, it's in short sequences you, you, using sort of Illumina technology, even in the sort of high throughput, it's really hard to do good assemblies because, um, you, you, first of all, we don't have many Y chromosomes because they've been sort of this really um, hard target to hit. And so you're using, you know, you're always using the X chromosome, which is sort of the most closely related thing. Um, but that's where to put the sequences when they're repetitive and they might have been moving around is is pretty tough. And so that's where this team um, picks up and comes in um, for sticklebacks. There has been all kinds of great progress on the Y chromosome of humans, which is completely different from sticklebacks. Um, and But only a handful of species really with Y chromosomes. And so they end up um, tackling this um, roughly 20 megabase chromosome, which isn't that massive. They ended up sequencing the entire genome, um, I think to about 75 X coverage. And, um, they had a few clues of what might be going on already. And I think that kind of helps sort of set the kind of, kind of scaffolds the work or gives them 
a little bit of a basis to start. And so a lot of this work came out of Katie's lab, some out of um, Michael White's lab, who has his new lab in, in Georgia. Um, so first of all, they knew the size. They also knew that there were three massive inversion events. And so this turns out to be a pretty common feature in the sort of early evolution. You kind of asked about that. What is like kind of the, well, how do you go from being two X's to like an X and a Y? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that often happens is that you get these inversions. In the, and so basically, you know, over long stretches of sequence, if you went from A to Z, if then you look in the new Y chromosome, it goes from Z to A. It's just flipped around. It's just flipped around. And that's enough to sort of lock out, for the most part, or in, in some cases, recombination can't happen as easily if you just make that switch. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. recombination sort of relies on um, pairing homologous sequence. And if you've just flipped it around, and if it's a really big um, inversion, then there's uh, less of a basis to actually do um, the um, sort of pairing that you need to to do recombination. How and common so, are rever- inversions, do you know? Yeah, they're pretty common. Um, and so I think in some of that work with Drosophila, the, the Neo-Xs, um, I think that that's a, a common theme, that you get these um, inversion events. Mm-hmm. And in fact, as we'll see here, they can even become a way of like um, dating when things happen, because it's like w- when, once, since it's not the entire chromosome changing all at once, it's just a portion of it. Um, that means that the parts that aren't inverted in, you know, theoretically can still recombine. And in fact, for the sticklebacks, the three spine, st- <laughs> three spine sticklebacks, there's still two megabases that can recombine with the X mm-hmm. chromosome. Mm-hmm. So it's not totally locked away um, from its um, sort of ancestral chromosome pair. There's still some recombination that could happen. Um, in that smaller region. And, but you could imagine like tomorrow, maybe um, there's a fourth massive inversion that locks away that last mm-hmm. two megas. Mm-hmm. If that somehow spreads through the whole population over some course of time, then that would be sort of um, the next step in the Y chromosome diverging from the X and then undergoing something of uh, this kind of um, degradation process or, um, you know, at the very least sort of this messy, chaotic uh process of change that you see in some of the other regions that are already locked away. This doesn't happen with autosomes, right? Because if it did, that'd be lethal, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. So that will, and we'll kind of hint at this with some of the types of genes that they find um, in these uh, that are sort of kept around in these inversions. But Mm -hmm. uh, so there are certainly inversions. Some of them, in fact, are, um, uh, so many of them can be lethal. And so you have a strong purifying selection for these to be left out of the population. Um, there are a number of human genetic diseases, though, that are associated with inversions. Um, and you end up with, um, because that can throw the regulation, so at the breakpoints, it can throw the regulation of the genes nearby, um, sort of out of balance. Um, that can have a pretty strong clinical phenotype. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, it's kind of the range of all different things. You can, there are also probably inversions that are, if they're small enough, and if they're in a region of the genome that's not... Um, really essential or, um, you know, it doesn't, dis- isn't very disruptive that those things probably happen all the time. Hmm. Yep. Kind of, so that I think every combination between so deleterious that they're culled out of the population to sort of minor deleterious that you might have someone who has um, a pretty severe disease phenotype all the way to sort of neutral in the sense that you don't see much going on. Um, and then in some cases beneficial. So the idea here is that if, as these um, inversions have happened, this sort of facilitates um, this process of having an XY system, of having two sexes and sort of locking that in, at least um, temporarily over, and could be for, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of years, as a um, sort of basis of having two sexes in a population mm-hmm. to then facilitate recombination. So in that sense, it, I think you would consider it a beneficial outcome, just again from sort of, if you step back and look at the influence it has on the population as a whole over evolutionary time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, those are, um, so the question then that they wanted to ask since they had, um, they're working on the sticklebacks is basically for these heteromeric sex chromosome, um, systems, um, it, where we have, uh, you know, a deepening knowledge about the human case, but that's like 300 million years of divergence. What are the early events or what, what happens just when recombination stops between heteromorphic sex chromosomes? Are there, sort of, can you kind of catch that snapshot at this sort of 25 million year window and see whether there are things specific to the process of sort of like, I don't know, maybe in the development of a sex chromosome, this is now like a probably past toddler. Maybe it's a like grade schooler or something like that. It's not quite an adolescent sex chromosome relative to the 
kind of middle-aged sex chromosomes that humans have, something like that. So that was sort of the big question, I think, that drove the study. And then um, because um, you've got sort of the tools already in Stickleback, um, in a great reference genome, although it was a female fish, it sort of sets the table for, for doing this work. Mm-hmm. So what they did <clears throat> is they turned to um, PacBio, these long reads. And so the advance here is that Unlike the Illumina reads or the um, older Sanger reads um, that are, um, you know, you can actually start to piece together repetitive regions of the genome. You can actually deal with inversions, depending on how big they are, by assembling high quality but much longer chunks of sequence. Um, And this is getting uh, better and better. And so here, you know, they do some sequencing and they get about 75x coverage across the entire um, across the entire genome. But then what really I think kind of pushes this to the next level is um, to use some um, uh, uh, technologies that weren't, wasn't originally for this. this. So this idea of chromosome com- confirmation capture, high C. Mm-hmm. Have you covered this in, in uh, other podcasts? I don't think we've talked about it on Twivo. I think we have. And yeah. uh, also with entered the virology textbook this year. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yes. <laughs> That's great. So I'll let, I should let you explain what this uh, high C is or this chromatin immunoprecipitation technique. Putting you on the spot High C here. chromatin confirmation capture. Mm-hmm. There are actually many different, uh, what should we say, Var- varieties with, with different names. Yeah, great. Um, but this is one it's a, it's essentially a way of looking at the spatial organization of chromatin right dna and its proteins um associated with it what you basically you do is you cross link the dna mm-hmm. you then cut it up typically with rest- restriction enzymes and then you take the pieces and ligate them mm-hmm. together then you reverse the cross link um and um Basically, amplify that and and sequence it. So you you are cross linking initially DNA that's together in space, right? Mm-hmm. And then you yep. chop it up, and then you release the cross link so that you can sequence it and say who's associated with who. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's basically it. Yeah, agreed. And so they show the result of that in Figure One of the preprint. <clears throat> and so it's just this kind of di- diagonal red line. It's not the most you know inspiring. Um, graphic, but what it represents is a ton of work to try to assemble the Y chromosome from sort of head to tail. Mm-hmm. And so, just as you're saying, so on the X and Y axis is the Y chromosome scaffold position um, as measured in megabases um, from zero to 15. They, they don't assemble the entire 20 megabases. There's still, even in sort of high quality assemblies, there's always these sort of tough spots um, to sequence. But mm-hmm. this is this is illustrating then sort of the outcome of combining all of their sequencing and then the high C to try to assemble this. And so the um, red diagonal line sort of shows an enrichment of those associations. And basically the idea is from a, like a very local level, the DNA closest to the DNA um, is probably going to have a stronger signal just by um, physical proximity. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some red dots that are kind of off in the sidelines there and that could be cases of like repetitive sequence that is duplicated in different regions and so um, that kind of makes it challenging you can't just sort of lean on these chromatin ip approaches Um, and in fact they spent quite a bit of time here describing how they go back and make a lot of um, artificial chromosomes backs actually but bacterial artificial Mm, chromosomes mm -hmm. to examine or sort of cross-reference the proposed high c to the proposed uh uh, pack bio long read sequencing. Mm-hmm. And so basically what they're doing is they're just taking smaller chunks of the stickleback genome, putting it into bacterial artificial chromosomes, bacterial plasmids, sequencing those, and then starting to see how those tile onto the larger picture there. And overall, it looks like they um, you know, have a pretty good agreement. Um, they have sort of color codes based on sort of the confidence they mm-hmm. feel that those chunks are sort of assembling into this new Right, um, right. Uh, yeah, Y chromosome. Some discordant regions, um, and actually, that points out sort of again the volatility in some way of these um, Y chromosomes. And so they actually to do this, they take some samples from some different individual fish um, from 
uh, Paxton Lake. I actually don't know where, I didn't have time to look up where that is exactly, but those are, this, that's the stickleback population they chose um, to do the, the um, Y chromosome assembly. Um, and <clears throat> some of those discordant regions might actually represent that even within the population today, there could be some pretty significant differences in the composition of the Y chromosomes because these things mm. are evolving so rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, it's in British Columbia. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's where a lot of that's one of the kind of major starting points of stickleback research um, in the last generation or two of science. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so then once they have, um, you know, and no genome's ever done, so there's, um, it, and it's that's kind of a fascinating side question is like when do you actually have like you sort of put forward what you might call a high quality assembly. Um, it still could have mega bases of holes. There's mistakes in there, all kinds of things. But it is, you know, it's sort of this sliding scale of where you have a big enough advance to sort of understand the biology in a new way. And so I think that's what the, the case they're going to make in the rest of the paper is that they've, with all of that work, um, sort of the technical advance on the genome science side, that they can actually say some interesting things mm-hmm. about these relatively young Y chromosomes. So and the first thing in figure two is just to sort of look at, well, what's here? Or how does this compare? to the X chromosome. And so here they've kind of color coded so you can see the three uh, major inversions that they describe. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can kind of put together, they've got illustrated in two ways, um, sort of the old classic linear chromosome. And then in panel B, they just show side by side in sort of a circular, half that circle is the mm. assembled Y and the right half of that circle, which is a little bit bigger, is the reference X. Mm-hmm. And they show where the sequence sort of corresponds. You can actually see these little inversions as the sequence kind of crosses over the middle of the circle. Uh, and in this case, it illustrates it pretty, uh, pretty cleanly because they're, they are really large, you know, megabase level inversions that um, block the way recombination. Am, am I correct in seeing that besides inversions, there's also been some truncations of uh, sequences? Yeah. That's exactly right. So that's another kind of major theme um, that we know from human Y chromosomes, for example, is that you get these massive deletion events, um, indel deletion events. Um, and so that is the case here in the um, Y chromosome for sticklebacks. It looks like you don't need 300 million years to do this. You could do this over the course of 20 million years for sure. Yeah. Okay. So that's sort of the major, I would say, kind of like structural basis that they get to get from this. And then there are some features of chromosomes that are all kind of on the, you know, sort of the um, major list of genomic features or hallmarks. The same way I guess you'd go visit Mount Rushmore, you should also visit the centromere (laughs) of a chromosome. (laughs) And so this is figure three. And they're using, similar to the high C, this isn't quite as um, high throughput, but they're using an antibody to the centromere specific histone. So when DNA is wrapping up <clears throat> into form higher kind of order structures to really get compacted um, so that you can fit all of this genetic material into uh, you know, a physical space within the nucleus. Part of this involves wrapping the DNA on, um, on histones. And there's, the histones are actually, there's some, something like a zip code to them. And so in some cases, the histones are specialized and, and the centromeric histones are one example. So the centromeres, this is kind of familiar from high school biology where we, where you have, we have those kind of pictures in our heads of chromosomes themselves, almost like X shaped with a little dot mm-hmm. in them where mm-hmm. they kind of contract. That's the centromere um, at, where you actually get sort of physical contact and you can um, then pull through the process of things like DNA replication, one cell becoming two. And so here they use the, um, an antibody that re- recognizes that histone to then um, do immunoprecipitation or to pull down the um, DNA that's associated with the centromere-specific histone, and then you can sequence that. And then you can map that on the sequence assembly, and you get a peak shown in figure 3A, which is where the centromere histone, where the DNA that was associated with it was um, what they sequence. And so the peak is consistent with having a so-called metacentric chromosome, meaning the centromere is somewhat in the middle. So it kind of behaves like one of those um, kind of classic textbook pictures of what a um, centromere looks mm-hmm. like. Yep. So they're, it's in the right position, basically, from what we yeah. know. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that doesn't always have to be the case. You have mm-hmm. also these cases of paracentric would be the other where it's out near the very edges of the mm-hmm. chromosome. Right. Um, but that doesn't look like um, that's what's happening here. So that kind of, I think, marks basically the technical work of just getting a handle on, you know, both the quality, um, some of the discordance, some of the issues, but also that you have 
um, a pretty good data set here for understanding a, a, a Y chromosome that uh, hasn't been really studied well or where you haven't had those resources before. And so here, I think it gets kind of fun because then they can start interpreting like what's going on um, with the biology of the Y chromosome. And so this is and one of my favorite parts is sort of borrowing from archaeology. They propose three stratum of the Y chromosome. It's sort of like the same, I guess the analogy would be when you're digging up dinosaurs and there are those, you know, rock layers that might run for 50 million years or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then those can map onto eras. And so that's also what they're proposing um, and what chromosome biologists now propose um, for things like Y chromosomes that have these um, sort of massive evolutionary events that can then sort of change the biology. And so this would be based, each stratum or kind of rock layer of the kind of um, genome or DNA layer is based on the inversion event. And so the um, idea of the difference in time is like basically how long ago did you stop recombining with the X? Mm -hmm. That would sort of mark the time of a, a stratum. And so they can actually... Um, you know, in addition to the obvious inversion breakpoints, which is where instead of going from A to Z, all of a sudden you're going from Z to A, um, <clears throat> you also can measure um, substitution rates, uh, mutation rates. So the synonymous substitution rate, this is when you have a point mutation, so a DNA letter change, but even though you change the letter, it doesn't change anything about the, um, the um, codon or how it's interpreted by the ribosome. So you have the same protein, even though you have a point mutation. And what they see is actually you get a um, really different um, uh, substitution rates. And so, well, not, well, one of them is very close to the same, but one is very different. The oldest, or stratum one, where that you had this original big inversion event, actually has a much higher um, rate of synonymous divergence. Um, and that's probably because, you know, because the longer you're not recombining, basically, um, the less you're... Um, undergoing gene conversion events or sort of harmonizing the, the chromosome together based on recombination events that sort of bring it back to that first copy or sort of preserve it um, as you make mistakes mm -hmm. inevitably undergoing replication. And, the, and so the mistakes that are made are ones that are not lethal, right? Yeah. We, we wouldn't be seeing them. That's right. Or if they would be lethal, they're corrected by recombination. And so you sort of, sort of walk forward or it survives mm -hmm. um, somehow. So anyway, they can date this. Uh, they can also date this based on um, the um, the sort of um, time that's inferred for how or, uh, or the known substitution rates mm -hmm, with the, mm -hmm. the sister species, so that they can even sort of make a case for the dates of that. Um, before they do that, so they do mention so in you know consistent. You're always looking for it's always you know slightly circumstantial evidence here. So you've got the major inversions, or maybe a better way to say it is it's sort of like a sort of um, combination of evidence. Mm -hmm. So you've got the inversions. You also have the fact that that oldest region is hardest to assemble, so it has a lot of deletions. You brought up that point of how um, the um, Y chromosome is smaller. Most of the deletions are actually in that oldest stratum, and that's consistent with the idea is the longer you go, the more different you become, not only by point mutations, but also by deletions. Um, and then there's just lots of divergence. So um, compared to the, um, the sort of autosomal uh, regions of the Y chromosome, and even or of the X chromosome, and even the pseudo-autosome, so the two megabases that still can recombine between the X and the Y in these sticklebacks, um, you can kind of use that as a yardstick to see uh, divergence compared to the so-called pseudo-autosomal of the Y. Um, they note, so for the second one, they actually have the lowest level of non-synon, or the lowest level of non-synonymous substitution. So we've been talking about synonymous mutations. The non-synonymous ones are when you have a point mutation that actually does change um, a codon. So the point mutation means the ribosome reads out a different amino acid in the protein. And so that can have a pretty big functional consequence um, as a point mutation as the proteins themselves change. And so for the second stratum, they see the um, lowest amount or the lowest rate of, this, of these non synonymous changes. And that can be interpreted as a signature of purifying selection. So that there's something really important in stratum two or kind of as collectively relative to the others that um, evolution has acted on to um, keep it m more the same than, um, mm -hmm. and and that's it kind of gets at the other side of the coin here. So these things are not totally degrading; they're not going away. So Y chromosomes often encode really important functions in things like 
um, making sperm. So male specific functions that are sort of non-negotiable mm-hmm. might be enriched on the second sort of portion or the second rock layer <laughs> or in evolutionary time, the second region of the Y chromosome. Um, and in fact, they kind of go on, and this is now in figure five, to look at um, the enrichment of so-called haploinsufficient genes on the Y. And so this gets back um, to your earlier question as well, Vincent. So it's basically like, what can you get away with or what are the constraints on what happens with uh, as a Y chromosome diverges? And so haploinsufficient, these are genes that you need two copies of. Mm-hmm. Um, or else you have, um, a problem basically. And so that means that you've got, if that's a, <clears throat> a haploinsufficient gene that sits on the X chromosome, and then as the Y chromosome becomes the Y, it diverges from the X. Now that gene, if it's haploinsufficient, if you lose it, you're, you're not going to survive mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as individual in that population. And so then you get these enrichments of these so-called haploinsufficient genes because they're sort of non-compromisable. You can't get rid of them on the Y. You need to have them around. And what's interesting is so as they look at the three um, stratum or the three different timings of um, divergence uh, or the inversion events, so in the first and second, you actually see a difference in the or an, a statistically significant enrichment of ap- haploinsufficient genes. It's most uh, obvious in the oldest or stratum one of the chromosome probably just passes ex- significance for stratum two. And then stratum three is not significant, but it's starting to go that direction. And so what that says um, kind of indirectly is that um, the longer a Y chromosome lives or evolves, um, you know, the, in, the longer it's locked away um, from recombination, the more of an enrichment you get for things that you need two copies of. What do you mean by enrichment? Duplication? No, so just the retention in this case. So if you lose, so you can, as these, and Y chromosomes are sort of notorious for deletions and for losing mm-hmm. genes, but these are ones you can't lose because um, if you do, you can't survive. You're haploinsufficient, basically. Right, right. Yeah, yep, exactly. There's also a duplication story here, and that's gets to um, the last figure, actually, figure six. Um, genes present on the Y that have been translocated mm-hmm. from autosomes. And this actually will also get us into the um, mm-hmm. question you asked earlier, too, about sex determination. So um, the way they analyze this, now that they have um, uh, to, to ask what genes have arrived newly mm-hmm. on the Y chromosome since it diverged um, from the X, is to say, okay, what are the genes um, genome-wide now that are not on the X, um, excuse me, but are found on other autosomes? that are shared between males and females and then show up in another copy, um, on the Y. And it's kind of known that these are oftentimes like enriched for male specific functions because you're selecting. Yeah. That sure, you sure. In, yeah. yeah. And in fact, they do see a, um, enrichment as judged by, in this case, they look for the genes that are, are whether or not they're expressed in the tessies, which was, is obviously a very male specific function. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do see those enrichments. So that's what they're, um, illustrating in figure six. They also note, that there's an increase in transposable elements. And so, um, and most of them, again, are in stratum one, the oldest stratum. So stratum. So the longer you go without recombination, the more you could, maybe one way of saying it <clears throat> is that the um, region of that chromosome gets insulted with more transposable elements and they don't get removed through a process, again, through um, sort of gene conversion or removal by recombination-based events. So there might, you know, so that also kind of feeds into that idea that these things are getting kind of degraded or almost parasitized in this case, um, while they at the same time are getting enriched for male specific functions. And so it's kind of this really, I think, fascinating collection of genetic changes that like, as you said, or as Brenner said, are just messy Mm -hmm. (laughs) going forward. Okay. So then the last cool finding is, um, this idea of the sex determining genes. What is it that makes a male versus a female, not just from sort of a chromosomal standpoint, a genotype, but also the phenotype, right? So how is it that you end up developing testes or developing a female reproductive tract if you lack um, the Y chromosome? And so surprisingly for sticklebacks and for a lot of species, the answer is we don't exactly know, Um, but you can take a candidate gene approach. And so What's known for a lot of vertebrates is that um, some of the sex-determining genes involve this so-called anti-mullerian hormone. 
and I uh, I did look this up <laughs> before our podcast. So it's not for the evolutionists out there. It's not um, Mullerian mimicry here. This is named after um, Johannes Peter Muller, who is a, a German physiologist from the 1800s. Um, and this is more involved in um, hormone signaling. And so the expression of anti-Mullerian Mullerian hormone um, inhibits the development of the female reproductive tract. And so if you, um, you know, express a lot of this at the right tissues at the right time, you end up a male um, for a lot of vertebrates. So basically what they did was just a blast search across the Y. And what they found was um, several genes, including a gene encoding this anti-Mullerian uh, hormone specific to the Y chromosome. So uh, in fact, it's on the first stratum, the oldest part of the Y chromosome of the stickleback. Um, but so where did that come from? And so it turns out it's probably a duplication in a translocation from an autosome number eight. That's um, so it's not seen on the X chromosome, um, but it is actually seen on the autosome. And so you have to remember that both males and females encode this gene. It's just that males encode it twice, both mm -hmm. on the eight and on the Y. And so there's the idea then would be that there's something about having two copies, and in particular the one on the Y that changes the regulation or that you're expressing this at a different time and place based on the duplication and then sort of the divergence, that that is sort of get, would get to the basis of being a male stickleback versus being a female stickleback, where the female still has it on chromosome 8, just like the male does. But that's the sort of specific or different thing or the um, differentiating thing between males and females. But that uh, current date remains a hypothesis. So they're, they note, I think, in the discussion that they're following up on that now to see if that really does, if they can use that to explain um, the difference between a male and a female three mm. in stickleback. So it, it's it's just one gene that would be the major determinant. Yeah. So it can yeah it can be as simple as like a single gene, or it can be more complicated. It can be a cassette of genes. Um, so right, I think that was the case in the strawberry mm -hmm. sex chromosome yeah. story we right. considered, and then it was moving together as a whole group of genes, um, which put some some constraint on the ability of that to sort of work all together as a unit, a sort of yeah. biologically functional unit. Yeah. So in the stickleback, is this correct? The default is female unless you inhibit it and then becomes a male. Yeah, I think that's right. Or that's certainly a case for anti mullerian hormones and other vertebrates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. And so the guess would be that it's probably, that's exactly what's going on in the sticklebacks as well. Yeah. Yeah. Which would imply that a female like organism existed first, right? Uh, yeah, I think you could say that. Yep. And then, well, or, or, or so the thing is, so yeah, it gets tricky, right? So <clears throat> in this case, you're probably using anti mullerian hormone somehow in all the, in a lot of different vertebrate systems. Mm -hmm. However, you're using it independently. So there were, even before kind of the three spine, <laughs> I keep saying, I can't say three spine for some reason. Um, but before the three spines came up with the Y chromosome, their, or their most recent one, there certainly were still males and females of the ancestors of this species. And so it might have just been a different Y chromosome that had a different anti mullerian hormone. But honestly, we know so little about kind of mm. just turnover of Y chromosomes and how many ways you could do this. That's, you know, that's just a guess or mm -hmm. speculation at this point. Yeah. yeah. Well, why do you think that some organisms, these important genes, these yeah. determinants can pop around in cassettes, but <laughs> and others, they have to be on a Y. What's the advantage of putting them oh, on a separate so, chromosome? Yeah, right. For the, like, so for the homo... Uh, morphic versus the heteromorphic yeah. plants and animals, for example. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I don't, um, I don't know the answer. Both work, certainly. Um, I mean, it would be fun to speculate a little bit about just, well, and uh, sort of the you know basis of um, sexual behavior. Yeah. Actually, yeah. How is it that uh, males and female vertebrates? sort of get together the behavioral sort of ways versus how is it that um, strawberries become pollinated or plants become pollinated um, for an organism that doesn't really move or come together. You have pollinators as part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then contrast that to even, you know, like single cell systems um, where you've got <clears throat> sort of massive genetic exchange um, through, conjugative processes that are really different. It's just sort of this whole massive range. And yeah, and whether there are themes there that emerge or sort of reasons that one system might prevail over another based on the 
behavior or the kind of physical physiology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There must be something to that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, have, I have another question for you. Um, so we talked earlier about how the human Y is, is shrinking, right? From a thousand genes to about 80 now. Yeah. Do we have similar estimates for the stickleback? In term, Oh yeah. In terms of how many genes are lost. I didn't see that in here. They do have a couple of tables that get at um, duplications of genes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't, so I, it is overall a story of deletion, but it's also a story of duplication. And what are the tallies? I actually, yeah, I would have, probably have to dig a little bit deeper um, to find that. But I think it is true, uh, or, or they argue, that basically even in this young case, and in the end, you know, so they're able to date the oldest stratum to about 21 million years. They do the second stratum at 6 million years and the third stratum like 5 million years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think across all three, um, they basically see kind of all of the messiness, all of the chaotic kind of genetic events that you'd imagine. And so, and then if you go to, I think some of the Drosophila cases that are known, and these are sort of like, you know, very recent events, you also see a lot of this. And so I think what's emerging kind of across the board here is that, um, you know, regardless of whether it's a few million years or many hundreds of millions of years, mm-hmm. you sort of um, have all these mechanisms happening and it's just sort of an accumulation of them over longer times. Yeah. So I think the notion would be, you know, you wouldn't be a thousand down to 80. It might be a thousand down to 800 or something like that at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. I guess they know they've annotated most of this white chromosome, right? Yeah, that's right. And so, and they have a really nice, <clears throat> annotation of the X chromosome as well. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, no, it's very, uh, it, you can start to make uh, at, at least estimates. The Y chromosome, you know, it's important to remember that, uh, you know, work in progress. And so um, I think there's at least two megabases altogether missing from, not from the chromosome, but from their analysis of it, because those are just impossible to put onto their scaffold uh, or to, to include as part of their assembly. So they say we identified a total of 626 genes on the male-specific region of the Y. Okay. And yep. 33 of those had paralogs on autosomes, which you talked about before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that. I think that all maps onto stratum 1, if I'm remembering. So it's just one part of the chromosome. Yeah. Do, do some of those have functions that are not involved in uh, sex determination? Oh yeah. yeah, I think yeah. So well, and, and remember, so sex determination is a pre, can, is a pretty specific thing, kind of almost like a couple of things in a developmental switch. And that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whereas, but there are you know this enrichment for male specific stuff. So not only kind of just specifying the developmental basis of being a male or female, but then actually you know sort of the male specific um, traits that you see um, that now in all the way from. Um, making sperm to just like physical features that yeah. distinguish males yeah. from females. That now we're talking about hundreds of genes and, and different functions coming together somehow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> Pretty interesting. So, um, oh, the, and you know, I guess a couple of the last points, um, sort of in addition to all of the stuff they see kind of common to other Y chromosomes, they didn't see one thing that was missing so far from the stickleback story was that oftentimes, in addition, like as the male or as the Y chromosome is diverging, in addition to sort of acquiring genes, you also get these oftentimes these really massive expansions in gene copy numbers. So you just like repeatedly duplicate families of genes. They didn't really see that yet or or see that at all on the stickleback Y chromosome. So that could be one thing that's different. Um, and then the last point they note is that so these translocations, this is um, – sort of grabbing genetic material, grabbing genes from autosomes or uh, from other locations in the genome, um, that most of those events um, appear to be DNA-based. That is, they're an outcome of um, double-strand brand, double strand break repair, having uh, sort of an error or uh, something, a skip or a mistake that then leads to a translocation. And that's um, distinguished from RNA-based, so like when retrotransposons are copying and pasting through an RNA intermediate and then reverse transcribing that back into the genome. They really didn't see much of that on the Y, um, but I, I think you see that in some of the older cases known in the vertebrates. And so there could be some things, and whether or not that's just, you know, a low number of observations here, or if there's something to sort of the timing of that, of how 
kind of the mechanisms for genetic change might have sort of, um, you know, time specific um, properties. I think that remains to be determined with sort of more comparisons and sort of a, a better understanding of how sex chromosomes evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The other point you have here is that um, these translocations are DNA, not RNA based. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So they're not, they're probably not being um, propagated by things like retrotransposons, but instead by double strand break repair, which would be the DNA based mechanism. Although the fish do have retrotransposons, right? So that's not their they reason. Do. Yeah, no, they do indeed. So they're there, but for some reason they're not contributing yeah. um, to the, at least to the same degree that would be sort of analogous for the human Y chromosome or for primate Y chromosomes. And so I think that remains to be seen if there's something sort of going on here yeah. uh, that, that uh, reflects sort of the difference in the age of the sex chromosome. I'm just looking at a paper here. They say the most of the uh, non-LTR retrotransposons are relatively young in the mm. stickleback genome. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. As, as, uh, as is the uh, Y chromosome, apparently. Yeah, exactly. They're just still waiting to invade. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I just have uh, have a increased appreciation for the plasticity of genomes. <laughs> Yeah, I, cell know. I would say cell genomes because uh -huh. we know viral genomes can be that way. But uh, I guess I never thought of it. And and in fact, Nels, if you sequence everybody's genome on Earth, you'd probably find lots of little inversions and duplications and stuff oh, yeah. from person to person, right? No, that's right. And you know, I think we've kind of uh, we underappreciate that because the way you know when we say we're sequencing a genome, that can mean many different things. So if we're sequencing it. <clears throat> usually, you know, kind of like a 23andMe or Ancestry.com sort of a situation. A lot of times there you're just doing snip arrays. So you're yeah, just basically, yeah, yeah. right, you're hybridizing, you're not sequencing the genome, you're hybridizing it to a reference right. in sort of little chunks and then you're genotyping at those chunks. And that can give you, you know, the idea is that you're getting sort of the information you want. Where are your ancestors from? How closely do you match? Or do you have any mutations that could lead to a, a genetic um, disease or something like that. But what we have, that's not technically sequencing a genome. And that's, and when you're really sequencing a genome, um, it's, it takes a lot of heavy lifting if you want to know something about the Y chromosomes, if you want to know something about mm. even autosomes, but the more complicated events, the inversions, the kind of stuff where when you take, even if you are, you know, actually sequencing, you then take all of that data try to um, filter it or assemble it somehow. And if it goes, if it doesn't match something that exists, then w one of the first things that is done is it's just thrown away. Yeah, yeah. Medically, I guess people just have their exomes sequenced, right? Yeah. That's another example. So you miss all this other stuff where things are different and could influence gene expression, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Or influence. Yeah. There could be an inversion hiding out that yeah. actually, leads to a novel trait somehow or yeah yeah sure. yeah sure so right. exome is just not enough really yeah so there you're just getting all of the gene coding regions right. that are at least you know to an, and that's changing all the time right so as we we're still <laughs> discovering new genes believe it or not mm. in the human genome we're characterizing areas of the human genome and they're still adding to that list it's not we, we've covered the main i'd say the highlights have been <laughs> covered and there's been a lot of investment and attention um, but we don't know at all Nope. And so, yep. And so, and then the longer we go, um, the more we just do this kind of game of matching. And I think we start to underappreciate what's different out there, not only like kind of in references, but especially as you're saying, like across the population of the world, there's all kinds of crazy genetic gymnastics that have gone on people's chromosomes that we have no idea even exist. Yep. Yep. And when you have all these data, it's, it's a tough problem to analyze it. Yeah. It's not That's easy because right. it's huge. <laughs> it's huge. And even when you spend years of investment, sort of like in this work, um, you, you don't have a finished product. You have sort yeah. of a working That's product. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. That's right. Cool. Very neat stuff. Agree. Should we move to the yeah. mailbag here? Mailbag, yeah. Yeah, it looks like we've got a few. Okay. I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. So uh, Ben writes, um, to innocent varicella and cell needs, yay for... Biology anagrams. Oh, what's the what's the uh, anagram there? Do you get it? <laughs> I don't know if I do. I, just, I didn't read this carefully. I've got... It's an anagram. 
Cell needs varicella. To innocent varicella, T-I-V-C-N. Is this the combination of the letters? Are you kind of putting them together? We might have to. Um, yeah, an anagram is where you, it's a word made by rearranging the letters, right? That's right. So might have, to, might have to give us some follow-up help on this one. Ben. Oh, I guess all these letters must come to something. Yeah. But I don't know what. All right, I'm going to keep going. So after listening to the entire TWIP and TWIM catalogs, this is This Week in Parasitology, This Week in Microbiology, I am onto Twivo and loving it. Evolutionary biology requires such a different way of thinking than the than molecular biology I'm used to, but that kind of thinking can be incredibly important when considering key questions of molecular biology. While listening to some of the episodes about the evolution of sexual reproduction, the topic we're on today, I began questioning some of the evolutionary drivers where sexual reproduction is favored. This is well outside my normal field, so my understanding here may be flawed, but I've heard that in many instances, sexual reproduction is speculated to have evolved as a strategy to prevent mass extinction or significant reductions in fitness by pathogens uh, and parasites. Considering this, it's logical then to speculate that parasites such as plasmodium, uh, parasites that cause malaria, could have evolved sexual reproductive strategies to avoid immune clearance. My question then is, if sexual reproduction could evolve in many separate instances as a mechanism for avoiding pathogenic insults or avoiding immune clearance, what barriers prevent this from occurring in pathogenic bacteria or bacteria archaea that are infected by lytic phage? Uh, conjugation has clear parallels to sexual reproduction, but is not linked to replication and is therefore fundamentally different, which raises the reciprocal question of what might have prevented conjugation from evolving as a diversification strategy amongst protozoans in multicellular organisms. Would love to hear what you think about these very spicy questions. Uh, may Twivo remain under positive selection. Regards, Ben. Thanks, Ben, for the letter. And kind of on, um, you know, related to our topic of today, I would say, mm. same biological wavelength here. So I would say, um, <clears throat> and this kind of, we've talked about this on Twivo, um, as, as you're queuing in on, Ben, is sort of why put up with sexual reproduction at all? Um, because just from sort of a selfish genetic standpoint, if you could get 100% of your genes into the next generation, that's sort of like you're maximizing um, your genetic uh, input into the next generation. Whereas if you undergo the process of sexual reproduction, you're only getting 50% of your genes. And so how is it that you would put up with this? And so this, we've kind of talked about this at least peripherally today, that sort of the benefits gained by recombination, <clears throat> by kind of scrambling the deck might over the long run outweigh just pure clonal replication, which will start to break down a little bit like that Y chromosome might break down the longer it's locked out of recombination um, with the X chromosome. Uh, or in um, you know hermaphroditic populations that uh, self-fertilize, for example, um, or in um, species, and there are many of them actually, that appear to potentially have just given up on sexual reproduction. It might be a dead end um, from sort of a long-term evolutionary genetic Standpoint. So I actually I do think kind of getting to this question of the could the parasites get in on the action. I think that's uh, sort of the other side of the coin. Um, this would be a reason to put up with uh, sexual reproduction. This is the Red Queen hypothesis. Um, sort of the original Red Queen is that um, one of the things that might pay off um, by by doing recombination is having a, a kind of novel collection of alleles that will help you compete against predators or parasites or pathogens. And so, uh, yeah, I wouldn't put it past pathogens that they might do the same um, using mechanisms of diversification, including recombination, um, as part of um, avoiding immune clearance or as ways of getting around um, the immune systems that can come at them um, as well. Makes sense because you you study that in terms of transfer, gene transfer, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so then I would say, so I agree that, you know, in bacteria, in sort of phage systems with um, translocation or conjugation, things like happening in those cases, pretty different than recombination. Um, although maybe from a, a larger standpoint or a um, sort of theme of genetic diversification might very much echo the same thing that you could gain from sort of reproduction. But then this idea, the kind of the last question of what's preventing like, you know, multicellular organisms or protozoans from undergoing conjugation. I think 
that might get back to sort of behavioral scenarios, right? So how do you, as a um, multicellular organism, first of all, you've separated the germline from the rest of the somatic tissues. And so even just from a physical standpoint, getting germlines together um, so that, because th th these are the genes that will go on into the next generation, just from a logistics standpoint, some of these mechanisms that we see um, in bacteria um, or archaea, you just uh, probably can't pull it off from a uh, kind of anatomy standpoint. And then even I think for the protozoans, like the single cells, but you know, there you've got <clears throat> um, all kinds of, you know, or, or fungi, right? With cell walls and things like that. Um, some of the barriers that might come up to block parasites or other things could then uh, sort of push the evolution to then come up with other ways of exchanging genetic material. So like the way that yeast have two mating types, A and alpha, um, or protozoans can have seven mating types um, or more. Um, you've had all of these sort of wild uh, kind of um, advances in terms of the different varieties of sexual reproduction. Cells have defenses for DNA in the cytoplasm, right? So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a that's a barrier because they have to get, go through it to get to the nucleus. So I would yeah. imagine that that's a problem. But but we but despite all this, we do get HGT extensively, um, you know, in eukaryotes, for example, right? Yeah, that's right. And so, as you know, when you you look at that in terms of viruses, right? But uh, acting as vectors, and I think we do. Yeah. So that's how I think it's well certainly the case that in bacteria, um, that can sort of be the main means of genetic traffic in some cases. But yeah. I think we, I think we underestimate how much that could be happening in multicellular yes. organisms as well. And that, um, yeah, you're, as you're saying, Vincent, that's a topic near and dear to my heart is this idea of viruses as vectors um, in eukaryotic systems, uh, including multicellular organisms. And so that was one thing I think was really fun from the giant virus meeting was seeing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the case of protozoans as uh, oftentimes as hosts um, to these giant viruses, how much genetic mixing appears to be going on, um, including by horizontal transfer, as we heard um, some hints from Matthias Fischer in his lab and the, the cool sort of systems they're, they're um, discovering in some of the algal species that are associated with some of these giant viruses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the next one, kind of a similar idea topic. Anthony writes with respect to giant viruses, number 49. That's our last episode. Where the large number of genes came from is important. Why they are still there is two. There must be a cost with the production of a large genome, including time. Even though the resources come from a host, using them up means less virus at the end. Might the giant viruses have come from ancient phages whose bacteria hosts were the prey of amoeba and other unicellular eukaryotes? It would be a neat trick to simply abandon ship on the consumed bacteria and, and then infect the predator. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure it would happen quickly like that, though. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that the size of the giants is what allows them to forego receptors and just wait for phagocytosis. The question then is, why did the intermediate steps happen? What advantage would there be for a virus to be a little bigger, but to still too small for an amoeba to bother with? I'm speculating of an intermediate of being eaten while inside the original bacteria host. Ex excuse me, extra genes would then be useful so that the amoeba could be re reprogrammed to emulate, however necessary for virus replication, the original bacteria host's functionality. For the viruses found in permafrost, they were happy in a lab with current amoeba. It would seem unlikely that amoeba from far away in place and time would work so well. Perhaps they did because the giant virus has something of a Swiss army knife in its genome. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Well, yeah, what you're talking about is a broad host range, right? So in terms of amoeba, at least. Yeah, and maybe a corollary of broad host range is sort of evolutionarily like a time window of yeah, host range. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I think a, a, the question that's still lurking here is that are these the real hosts? Mm. Yeah. And are there others which does not negate the fact that, yeah, they're replicating in a contemporary amoeba. Mm -hmm. So they do have some um, Swiss Army knives. Yeah, I think that's a kind of cool way to look at it. I like that. So, and then, you know, at the beginning um, of the letter here, um, the idea of size, genome size, yeah. and the cost of it. So that's, yeah, that's another question I think is really fascinating and one that we've been thinking about 
here when it comes to pox viruses. And that was one of the fun things at that giant virus meeting that we talked about a little bit is just the um, variability in sizes. So, and, and again, I think in all of this work, how we're just sort of glimpsing um, at the uh, tip of the iceberg. So some of those giant viruses, for example, the ones that came out of the permafrost are sort of, um, you know, distinguished by these really huge genomes, in some cases, thousands of genes, megabase or more. But as people are doing more discovery work and, and you know, some of it metagenomics, just like scouring uh, nucleic acids from the environment and then doing more sophisticated assemblies, what's kind of coming into focus is um, giant viruses that are quite small. Some as small as we heard at that meeting, I think something like 70 KB. Does that sound right? Mm. Is it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then some of the smaller viruses, um, and it's all relative, so we're not talking about RNA viruses, we're talking about DNA viruses here, but some pox viruses that might be as big as half a megabase or or bigger um, that were recently um, discovered as well. And so it's kind of scrambling the deck a little bit for what is the kind of size range of a large DNA virus. And my sense is that, you know, a picture is emerging that there's all kinds of flexibility here. And sort of different ways of doing things that are, despite the extra time it might take to replicate, um, and when you're not dealing with sort of a tight uh, capsid uh, head requirement, that there is a lot of wiggle room from an evolutionary standpoint for genome size. Yeah, apparently a lot of these capsids have extra space for more DNA. Yeah. They haven't yep. reached the maximum. Yep. I mean, clearly, it doesn't cost to be big, Right at least not in the environments that these viruses are reproducing in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, most so far have been from the oceans, but we're beginning to see some of them coming up from other environments, other ecological systems. So we still don't know the exact extent. But I would say that at least in the ocean, it doesn't matter if you're big. Apparently not. If you're in a, a big bloom of e-hux, hey, <laughs> no That's problem. Right. you got a lot of food there. That's right. Well, and there's also... I- I'm blanking on the fellow's name right now, but who is, uh, he's, he's located in Hawaii and was telling us a little bit about, Greek, um, you know, it depends Greek, on where you sa- Greek steward. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Depends on where you're sampling, right? Um, in some of the more open, and I think that works still early, but in some of the more open ocean environments, you see bigger viruses relative to the more, uh, like the Bay side kind of areas where that's a mm-hmm. uh, higher kind of concentration of, hosts relative to the open ocean and so there could be something about that too the geography um that could relate to virus size which i don't i think it's too early to say for sure but the correlations are at least kind of intriguing to to consider the other part of the equation is that in most of these giant viruses most of the genes we have no idea what they are that's right the encoded proteins we we don't even they don't look like anything (laughs) That we right. know, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, no, no, yeah, right. Ahead, we sorry. have no idea if they're functional or needed. Can't do genetics with most of these viruses. There are no genetic systems. So it's a tough problem. A lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, which also makes it a fascinating yes. topic. And, and gets, again, to, to Anthony's point as well, sort of where are these genes coming from? And if you don't have a blast hit, then it's uh, other than another giant virus. That's a tough question to answer currently. Mm -hmm. I think the stuff that does have a blast hit, it's pretty interesting to see that it kind of ranges from, um, you know, archaea to bacteria to eukaryotes. And so it's really a grab bag. And then again, so the, which then raises all kinds of, I think, fascinating questions about the mechanisms of how genes are transferred from host to viruses or bystanders to viruses. And then potentially as a conduit back to hosts or back to bystanders somehow. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. Do you want to take that last one, Nels? I will. So this is from Michael, and he writes, Dear Vincent, Nels Rich, and the rest of the TWIV team, as a fourth-year graduate student at Michigan State University in plant biology, I often find myself enjoying Twix podcasts as I commute to East Lansing and to my various research sites around the state. Recently, I had the pleasure of listening to the following three podcasts in a single week. The first, Twivo 48, Flipping Out with Coanos on Caffeine. That was that fun coanoflagellate uh, episode we did on Nicole, some of Nicole King's recent work. The second, Twiv 575, Endless Giant Viruses, Most for, uh, uh, Sorry, Endless Giant Virus Forms, Most Beautiful. That was our um, video 
uh, podcast that you recorded at the Ringberg Castle at the Giant Virus meeting. And then the third, Twivo 49, a giant podcast on giant viruses, our last um, podcast that we recorded with Rich Condit. Listening to these three podcasts in that particular order was the most intellectually satisfying podcast consumption I've ever had. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for that, Michael. Appreciate the strong endorsement. All three episodes represent solid individual units, but as a trio, they build on one another conceptually and thematically, culminating in Twivo 49 with an exciting conversation in which Vincent, Nelson, and Rich review the giant virus, conf- con- giant virus conference while making connections to material introduced in the other two episodes. I'm a plant biologist and an ecologist by training, but I'm focusing my dissertation research on exploring the ecology and evolution of wild, that is non-crop plant virus interactions. The stuff you guys talked about in this trio of episodes, viruses as gene thieves, virus proteins involved in host enzymatic pathways, virus genes being incorporated into host genomes, this is the stuff that keeps me up at night. As we continue to learn more about the diversity and abundance of viruses that inhabit all the nooks and crannies of our great planet, I'm hoping that the community ecologists take note. Viruses can influence processes that shape communities and mediate biodiversity. Needless to say, I was thrilled to hear that Vincent is incorporating an ecological unit into his virology course. Based on the recent marine-themed TWIVs, I'm sure you'll have plenty of marine ecology included in the unit, but don't forget about terrestrial ecosystems. You have already you are already familiar with the Marquez et al., this is a 2017 paper, on three-way symbiosis that confers heat tolerance to a plant. But I want to point to you a series of papers that highlight the role of a plant virus in facilitating a dramatic shift in the community composition of California grasslands. Spoiler alert, exotic animal annual grasses invade and take over native grasslands by way of barley yellow dwarf virus. And then uh, Michael includes links to uh, several papers, three papers. The lead author on the 2005 paper, Carolyn Malmstrom, is my, invi- is my advisor and the person responsible for my newfound obsession with viruses. As a recent newcomer to the field of virology, your podcasts have been a wonderful source for me as I try to wrap my head around how viruses work. And they were particularly helpful for me in preparing for my comprehensive exams a while back. Thanks to all of you for your contributions to the these podcasts. They are important. Kind regards from Mike Oreiskamp at uh, East Lansing in the plant biology program there. Um, and then um, some links to the papers. Well, Michael, thank you a million for that really um, kind and um, inspiring letter. I think that's a great way to wrap up the mailbag for the uh, for the year here. And I'm really glad you had a chance to listen to all three in a row. I agree that was, for me, that was really fun um, uh, to put all of that work together. And more than that, to do it in person, um, it just worked out really well. Um, and then following up with Rich and, and Vincent in uh, Tweedle 49 was just, uh, again, kind of selfishly, a really great way to kind of um, think back on the highlights of that um, inspiring meeting and kind of put it together and, and, you know, to share it. And so I'm really, um, pleased and happy that you were also found that useful. So yeah. Vincent, we do, you do have, you know, I remember like, I think this was last year or two years ago, I guess at ASV, mm-hmm. um, you made a, I think a pretty strong commitment to focusing some more on plant virology. How's that going? No, not at all. <laughs> 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 no, we never really. I think we did a couple. Yeah. Um, and I had I had said to Ann Simon, you know, why don't you right. come on once a month? And she never. Uh, you know, I depend on people yeah. filling out the schedule. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I, I can't. I just can't keep chasing people forever. So she never did it. And then I ran into her mm. at ASV this summer, and she said, "I thought you wanted me on." I said. I'm waiting for you to fill out the schedule. <laughs> so do it. So we haven't done all that much, but there is a lot of good stuff out there, like these, some of these papers. It's a cool idea, this idea that, you know, a virus can facilitate invasion of a new plant by screwing with the ones that are there. It's it's cool, very cool. That'll definitely be part of the ecology lecture in my course. But I, I think this is great that, uh, you know, Mike clearly is into this stuff and got turned on by this 
trio, which kind of happened uh, randomly. You know, the Coano paper, Tweeva 48, you know, you pick that. And then it turned out that one of our guests at, at uh, the giant virus meeting uh, found a giant virus in a Coano. Yeah, <laughs> right? that's cool. That's so, right. And then I said, why don't we do a summary uh, of this whole thing? So, yeah, I think you're right. It is a cool uh, trio of podcasts. I, I would love if more people, you know, got turned on to the extent of, of Mike. I know a lot of people love our podcast, but I do think there are a lot more people out there that, uh, for whatever reason, you know, it's they're long, they're complicated. Uh, a lot of people don't like podcasts, mm. but I do think you're missing something. I mean, I, I listen to podcasts. I have time in my commute, and, man, they are great to listen and learn all kinds of stuff. So, all you people out there that are not listening, check it out. <laughs> yeah, no, I yeah. agree. Yeah, so that was Alex Warden, who sh she found that virus in the Coano that was the same species. And the, yeah, it was just, we just got kind of totally lucky that that collision happened. But yeah, no, I um, put in an amplifying word um, as, uh, uh, as well with Michael that um, plant virus systems are, are pretty cool. Ann Simon is great. So she's at the University of Maryland in <clears throat> um also famous for her work as a science advisor to the X Files back in the day. Maybe you know another nudge somehow could be a to bring in a Twip V this week and plant viruses somehow. No, I, I have to nudge her, but you know the thing is, um, I like uh, self motivated of people, course. right? When people say, "Oh man, I would love to do that," yeah. where do I go? Right? Yeah. Um, no, that's true. Instead of and me having to bug. Bug, yeah. bug. <laughs> no, of course. Yep. No, and podcasting is, uh, uh, you know, well, we're all really busy, and podcasting is not for everyone. That's the other thing, too. Yeah, but, it's true. Yeah. No, I yeah. think Ann wants to do it. I, I, You're right. I just need the bugger. I would rather <laughs> not have to bug people, but I, I'll try it. Maybe I'll make a New Year's resolution to oh, get around more. Yeah. Now, let's do some picks. What do you have this week? Oh, yeah. Good idea. So my pick of the week was just something that caught my eye on the New York Times uh, maybe a week ago or something like that. This is uh, in the trilobite, some of the science, the science um, you know, section uh, series. It's a small article entitled, uh, What a 5,700-year-old wad of chewed gum reveals about ancient people and their bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is lifting up a, a cool Nature Communications article where they – um, actually isolated um, or found or recognized that um, there was a, a old wad of gum, chewed gum or birch pitch, I guess is what people chewed 5,700 years ago. And were able to do some ancient genomics on it or, you know, some DNA sequencing and actually find out something about what was associated with that chewed gum and presumably associated with what that person had been eating recently. And also the bacteria that might've been associated with it. I just thought it was kind of a cool, you know, we've talked some about ancient genomics, the Neanderthals, the Denisovians, um, some of Svanta Paibo's work, et cetera, um, over in Twivo over the years. And, you know, how kind of creative people are getting with ancient genomics these days, including, um, you know, exploring what might be found in an old wad of gum. It also made me think, you know, for kind of like evolutionary biology in the future, like when you just are chewing a stick of gum and then spit it out on the sidewalk or something, <laughs> it could be a breakthrough. In, you could make the New York Times in, you know, a million or two years or something like that. Nah, we're so. not going to be here, man. Well, true. Yeah. <laughs> a thousand years max. Yeah, we'll see. I think this is so cool. This is yeah. just great. They didn't need to have bones, you know? Um, right. It's not that all that old, right? It's not. Not that old on the, yep, on the scale, scale of records of, yep, but it's a pretty cool. That is great that they could get the whole genome from this. So you yeah. wonder how far back people put this, this uh, resin in their mouth, you know, and, Saliva, man. It's cool. It's just awesome. Right. I love it. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. That's, a, that's, you, that's a paper we might have done on Twivo, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. good point. Yeah. Uh, that, that could have been another uh, another entry into Twivo, but at least it made the pick of the week yeah, here. Yeah, that's cool. How about you, Vincent? What's your pick, science pick of the week? So there's a website at Rutgers for the climate change, uh, sorry, the Rutgers Climate Institute. Mm -hmm. I'll put a link to that. And they have uh, just issued... They are New Jersey sea level rise reports. Hmm. And there's a long version of it here. There's also a summary, which is a one-page PDF. Um, now, I'm interested because uh, I'm on the coast here. I, I live uh, 
New York and New Jersey have a coast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, I actually have a little sh- summer home at, at the Jersey Shore, which is about 50 yards from the beach. Mm. Wow. So I'm very concerned about sea level of rise. Of course. Yeah. And uh, so this little PDF summaries a, a 2019 science and technical advisory pattern. Uh, so basically, they have two different scenarios. They have the magnitude of sea level rise and the rate of of sea level rise. This is just for New Jersey. Yeah. And they have historical rates. So for example, sea level in New Jersey rose 1.5 feet along the coast from 1911 to 2019. Oh, wow. Compared to 0.6 feet globally. Wow. Projected near term, the coastal areas are likely to experience sea level rise of 0.5 to 1.1 feet in the next 30, well, from 2000 to 2030, and 0.9 to 2 feet between 2000 and 2050. Yeah, wow. And near-term future rates of rise. So the rate over the last 40 years from 1979 to 2019, the sea level rose at a rate of 0.2 inches per year along the New Jersey coast. Mm -hmm. And it's expected to average rates of 0.2 to 0.5 inches per year over the next uh, 40 years. Wow. So that's a lot. A lot of the coast is going to be Underwater. Yep. I can tell you that two feet would put my home underwater because we're basically at sea level. Right? Wow. And the whole, our home is on a barrier beach, which is about a mile wide mm-hmm. and is about, I don't know, 50 miles long, goes up the side. If you look at a map in New Jersey, you see the barrier beach along mm-hmm. the coast. That whole thing will be underwater. Yeah. In 50 years. Okay. This is, this is happening. All right. This is not. Maybe fiction, this, that, bullshit. It's happening. Yeah. <laughs> and whether you want to <laughs> realize right. it or not, I want to sell my house before it's underwater. <laughs> well, that was my next question, actually, is how long <laughs> you can hold on to that. Well, you know, no, but, uh, yeah. if it's underwater, the real estate value is really low. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, my family says, well, let's enjoy it for a couple more years, which is fine. But mm-hmm. I'd say, uh, you know, in 10 years, we should get out of there. I don't want to leave it to my kids and then they have to have nothing, right? Um, so. Yep. Well, yeah. And then, the, yep. I want to sell it and move to Utah. There, well, yeah. So I was thinking <laughs> that I'm at about 5,000. Um, LD Lab Studios is about 5,000. So we're okay on that front. But you have other you know, issues. It's a, false, it's a false sense of comfort because the same forces that go into that kind of sea level change. And it can, and just as you're saying, you know, the, the local increases are different than the global averages. Mm. Uh, in some cases, quite dramatically. So this is already, I mean, we're reading more and more stories about um, small um, communities living on islands at very low that are losing their homes. Yeah, uh, sure. With the permafrost melting in Alaska, you know, entire small towns that are being relocated already. And so this isn't going away. It's getting sort of more um, dramatic and impactful almost by the year. Yeah, we have to do something about it. We can't yeah. just sit back and enjoy things. Mm. Got to do something. We have to have major changes in how we're living because we're assaulting the planet. It yeah, can't, that's right. It can't handle it. <clears throat> no, that's really true. But anyway. That's a big one. Yep. I mean, I think to me, some of the, in addition to sort of the, the personal things we can do, which are still relatively small, it's how do we start to organize as larger communities and start to get representation that uh, in elected positions will take this seriously in order to reorganize how we uh, prioritize our yeah. resources to start to, to face this. And, and I mean, it's one of the crazy things is, you know, over the last decade or so, I think there's been a lot of talk about, Oh, you know, it's a debate or the evidence isn't out there or, or that even this, I think, crazy notion that scientists are just exaggerating because they're going to make money if they convince people of this. <laughs> and of course, like, you know, I think what we're starting to see now pretty clearly is actually scientists have been underestimating this because scientists are actually pretty cautious. Um, the peer review process is a pretty rigorous one where if you're going to make sort of, um, you know, ambitious claims or dr- dramatic claims, drastic claims, you, they need to be met, you know, backed up. And so that can cause, I think in especially complicated systems like climate science to actually underestimate. And that's starting, we're start, starting to see that now where, um, and then I can almost imagine 
this sort of crazy response from sort of the other side, so to speak, in terms of skeptics saying, oh, well, why didn't you scientists warn us of any of this? <laughs> Where, you know, basically for the last <laughs> decade or more, people have been, scientists have been, yeah. you know, light their hair on fire and scream about this. And so, no, human behavior at this, in, in these kind of global impact things is um, pretty, can be pretty depressing. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. unfortunate. I mean, you know, people do have issues and they have to deal with them in their daily lives, but yeah. got to look forward because if you have kids and they're having kids and they're having kids, you know, it's not going to be nice for them. That's right. What are we doing here? Yeah. All right. That is Tuivo 50. That's the last Tuivo of this decade, Nels. Oh, pretty good. <laughs> we spent about half of it podcasting together. We I've, did. I was it's been a fun pleasure. Looking forward to the next. Next decade. Decade, let's do it. Yeah, I'm good for another decade at least, probably two. You and me both. And you can find uh, Tuivo on any podcast player, uh, on your phone or tablet. It's even on other places like Pandora, Spotify. If it's not, let me know. We'll put it there. When you go to the website, microbe.tv slash Tuivo, where you can find show notes. And if you uh, do listen that way, please subscribe. You get every episode automatically. It's free, and we know how many people are listening. We'd like to know that. It's important for us. Uh, if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. It's a good time of year to contribute. A few people have been doing that. You go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You could use PayPal or pay or uh, Patreon to give us uh, either a bunch of money up front. Some people do that. Give us a hundred bucks. So here's a hundred bucks for a couple of years. I'll, I'll see you in a few years. That works. Yeah. Or you could give us a buck a month, PayPal or Patreon. Either way, it doesn't matter. Help us out. We'd love your support. We have expenses and yeah. we'd like, we'd like to do more. Yeah. We would like to do more. No, it'd be fun. And it's sort of a, a holiday gift you give yourself of uh, science podcast listening. And if you don't want to give anything, that's fine. You can keep listening because it'll always be free. Absolutely. Because <laughs> we don't. We want you to learn. And there's, if there's a monetary impediment, that's not good. So there is none. The only thing here is time, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. We're not going to pay all Twivo. Nope, that's for sure. Never. Yep. Questions and comments, go to Twivo at microbe.tv. Nels is at cellvolution.org. On Twitter, he's L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Yeah, thank you, Vincent. Happy holidays and happy new year. We'll see you on the other side of 2020 for the next Tuivo podcast. 2020, I like that year. That's a yeah, good too. year. You should be optimistic. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Tuivo is by Trampled by Turtles. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. <laughs>